Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk and this is episode 97 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So we've got a great show queued up today. It's on the topic of letter writing, something we haven't covered yet on the show. But before we get to that, wanted to let you guys know about a few things going on here. So first of all, I have just created a club for widowed parents on the new social media app Clubhouse. And if you're wondering what is Clubhouse, um, it's actually a really cool thing. It is an audio based social media app. So there's no video, there's no chatting, there's no posting, there's no pictures. It is truly audio talking only. And it's called Clubhouse. And within that app, there are multiple uh, smaller clubs and, and people can start a club in there. And on various topics, you can search around on lots of different topics and find clubs that might be of interest to you. And then when someone has a club, they can start a, a you know, room and they can be ad hoc, they can be scheduled, um, chats on different things. And it's pretty cool. Actually, you can drop into some pretty interesting discussions and you can participate in talking. You can listen in while others are talking. Um, there's kind of some different ways to participate. And of course, you can drop out at any time. So um, the one limitation on it right now is that it is only available for the iPhone. So Android users, I think you're going to have to wait a bit. I hear they are working on something for that. Um, but for the time being, it's iPhone only. But um, for those of you who have an iPhone who are already on Clubhouse or might be interested in checking it out, uh, search for this club. It's called, well, it's called Widowed Parents, the club. And I actually wanted to call it Widowed Parents, the club nobody wants to join. Uh, you might have heard of our club of widowhood being referred to that way sometimes, and uh, I thought that was just too perfect for a clubhouse. But alas, the field for the name of the club was too short. I couldn't put in the whole thing. So it's called Widowed Parents, the club. Search for that or search for me at Lisk Jenny on Clubhouse. Uh, same name as all the social media platforms at Lisk Jenny. Um, if you're not on Clubhouse yet, I do have a few invitations available. Um, so shoot me a note if you'd like an invitation and you have an iPhone. Um, and I'll see if I can get you set up with that. It's a pretty cool thing. And, um, I, it seems to be, uh, you know, a good way to, for to do some community building, to share ideas and experiences and stories and, and share with one another and learn from one another. And, um, connect and feel less alone, which I think, you know, as widowed parents, it's, we often feel alone, We're maybe the only people we know in our social circles in this situation. And then of course, throw a pandemic on top of everything and everybody's even more alone. So, um, I think it's pretty neat that this, um, new clubhouse is starting to take off. So, um, have a look at that. And, then I have a question for you guys. Um, actually, for my listeners who are in Canada, um, I have a question. I hear that lots of people in Canada love reading with Kobo. Um, I think they have their own e-readers for e-books, and I heard they also have an app um, if you'd rather read on an iPhone or an Android phone. Um, but I hear that, anyway, Kobo is the most popular platform for E read, e, you know, for reading ebooks in Canada. And I was just wondering, you guys who are in Canada, if you could just, like, let me know. Does that sound right? Is it, did I read the wrong thing? Um, I'm thinking about some ways to reach more people in, um, you know, widowed parents in Canada who might be interested in a future widow. And I thought that maybe experimenting with Kobo a bit might be a, a good thing to do. So, um, if you're in Canada, let me know if you think that would be worthwhile. And I also heard that some other countries are pretty big users of Kobo, but I'm not sure which ones. I think one of them might be the Netherlands, um, maybe Australia. So if you're in another country where, where Kobo is pretty popular, um, let me know. I'd love, love you guys' input on that. Okay. Um, I think that's all for now, and let's get on with today's show. I had such a great discussion with Dara Kurtz for this episode. Dara is the author of I Am My Mother's Daughter, Wisdom on Life, Loss, and Love. 
We talked about intentionally creating your legacy and your family traditions, and we dive deep on the topic of letter writing. We talk about why it's important, along with lots and lots of tips from Dara. You'll want to make sure you listen for the three different types of letters, just because letters, special occasion letters, and legacy letters, what they are, and tips for all of them. I know I, I was uh, furiously taking notes as we spoke because I need lots of tips um, on getting started. I know I feel like writing letters is probably something that I should do more of, including um, writing letters to my kids. And it's just one of those things that seems to keep getting put off. So um, we really had a terrific discussion about this. And I think after talking with Dara, I feel a little more motivated to get started and feel a little bit um, easier, well, a little bit better about doing so in in terms of um, feeling like it would be a little more manageable task. So I hope you enjoy my discussion with Dara Kurtz. Support for this podcast comes from BetterHelp. You can talk with a licensed professional therapist online, anytime, anywhere. Visit BetterHelp.com slash widowed parent to learn more and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash widowed parent. I hope you'll check it out. My guest today is Dara Kurtz. Dara is the author of I Am My Mother's Daughter, Wisdom on Life, Loss, and Love. She is also the creator of the Crazy Perfect Life blog. Dara is joining us today from North Carolina. Dara, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, good. Well, I've really been looking forward to talking with you today. Um, And, you know, what we're really going to talk about is, I guess I would summarize it as intentionally creating your legacy and family traditions. It's kind of a broad yeah. umbrella, right? But I know you've, you've between your book and some of the work you've done, you've got a bunch of interesting um, ideas about letter writing. And let's just jump right in. Uh, <laughs> so much to talk about. <laughs> I know. And I don't need to spend all this time setting it up. We'll just start. Let me ask you first, because your blog is called Crazy Perfect Life. So what does that mean? So I started my blog about over five years ago, at the time I had just finished going through breast cancer and Mm. actually it's been seven years since I went through breast cancer. So I'm super grateful to be on the side of it, but I had just finished going through that. I was a financial advisor. I had just quit my job because I thought, you know what, this doesn't speak to my heart anymore. This isn't what I want to be doing. And I thought I want to start writing. I want to help other people. I want to share what I've been through and, and try to use that for good. And so I was thinking about different names and crazy perfect life just stuck because here's the thing. Life is crazy. We never know what's going to happen every day. As we all know, there's a lot of uncertainty that can come out of nowhere, but at the same time, it's life, which is the greatest gift of all. And so just because of the fact that we're living, we're alive, it's perfect in that regard. And so that's kind of how I came up with crazy, perfect life. Yeah. I love it. And you know, I think that, um, well, my listeners certainly can uh, relate to the idea that <clears throat> who knows what kind of crazy things can happen. And I guess, you know, really everybody now with the pandemic we're living in, it, I think that message probably resonates very much. So that's terrific. Thank you. Good. Um, okay. So you've had a few different experiences in the category of like letter writing and being the recipient of letters and participating in writing them and back and forth. And Let's talk about some of those. And I was thinking maybe we could go back in time and just, you know, chronologically. Um, Yeah, no, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, when I was 28, my mom passed away from cancer and Mm -hmm. I was pregnant and I had my first child a few weeks later and it was devastating for me. My mom was my person. We talked all the time throughout the day. And really the same weekend I found out I was pregnant, I found out that she had advanced cancer and the bigger my belly got, the sicker she got, and it was just devastating. And so, Mm. um, you know, after that experience, I had my first child, I went back to work, I tried to distract myself from thinking about all the pain and the grief. And, um, you know, as a lot of you probably know, you can't run from grief, right? Um, Eventually, it's going to catch up with you. And so what happened was, I really feel like grief followed me around like my shadow for a large portion of my life. And randomly, 
when about a year ago, I remembered that I had a Ziploc bag of letters in my house, letters that were written to me for the time I was nine years old, the first time I went to sleepaway camp until I graduated from college. And one day, finally, I had the courage to sit down and open this bag of letters. And I was blown away by how relevant they were, how much wisdom they contain. I felt like I was having a conversation with my mom. I could feel her voice. I could feel her personality. And really, from my adult perspective, I got a glimpse into her life at the time that she was raising her kids mm-hmm. at the time that she wrote the letters. And it was an unbelievable gift. And I, I, I couldn't believe the impact that it had on me. Mm-hmm. And also in there, I found the letter that my dad had given me on the morning of my mom's funeral. He came into my room and said, Dara, your mom wanted me to give this letter to you the morning of her funeral. And she had written one to my brother and he had one as well. And so um, it was just a, a culmination of letters that I had received mostly from my mom throughout my whole entire childhood. And, you know, like I said, until I graduated from college and, and so it really impacted me and, and helped me really understand how powerful this tool can be and what a gift it is to the recipient. Mm-hmm. Mm. So I'm hearing almost two different types of letters. I mean, there's the, the, the one letter that you got on the day of your mom's funeral. Did she write that once she was sick and, you know, near knowing that she was nearing the end of her life? Yeah. So that's a great question. I actually believe there are three different kinds of letters. I feel like there's the just because letter that we write just because where I'm thinking about you. I just wanted to say hi. I just wanted you to know that I care. Then there's the special occasion letter the letter that we write someone maybe at um, a wedding or a a, a very special birthday or a baby naming, a christening. And then there's the letter that we write, which is the legacy letter, the letter that we write because we want the recipient to receive words written from us when we pass away. And Mm -hmm. so my mom wrote that legacy letter to me when she was very, very sick. And it was incredibly short. It was just a few sentences. And that taught me something. It taught me that it's best to write a legacy letter when you're not sick, when you don't plan. Look, none of us plans on anything happening. And hopefully mm. every listener is going to be alive for a very long time. But life is uncertain. And so I do believe that it's best to write a legacy letter to the people that you love and care about when everything is fine. And when you can really sit down and put a lot of thought into what you want to say to the person that you love. And there's so many different ways to do that. But the letter that she wrote me was very, very short because she was so sick. And I know that there was a lot that she would have liked to have said to me that she didn't say in that, in that letter. Mm, mm -hmm. Such a good point. And I'm, I'm guessing, well, tell me if I'm wrong here. There's maybe a corollary point that, once she got to the point where she couldn't write that longer letter, you still, it was great that she wrote what she could, even if it was oh, short. Oh gosh, I was so, it, it's really the ultimate gift because here she is thinking about dying and thinking about what it would feel like to me, for me to not have her in the morning of her funeral. And it was such an incredible gift and it was so generous and I was unbelievably just so grateful that she did that a hundred percent. And I'll never change being so grateful that she wrote that letter and that I had that letter, but mm. it, it did make me, it did make me think, can I put a little bit more intention around writing a legacy mm-hmm. letter? And mm-hmm. what does that mean? And what does that look like? And I talk a lot sure. about that in my book, because I do believe that if we really take the time to think about what we want to say to someone, it really can be, an incredible, an incredibly meaningful letter that Mm. someone receives. Mm. So, you know, this is reminding me a little bit of when my husband was sick, a friend of mine suggested that I get him to write cards to the kids and they were nine and 11 at the time. So she was like, you know, 18th birthday, this or that graduation, wedding day, kind of like some milestone Mm -hmm. cards. And one of the things I wondered was like, like, yikes, like, is that going to be comforting or is that going to be creepy? 
right? Like to open a letter from your dad 15 years later, like, is that going to be unnecessarily hard or is that going to be wonderfully touching and supportive? I think my initial thought is it would be incredibly comforting and it would be very lovely to be able to hear words written from a loved one who is no longer with us. I definitely think that. Um, but also I know that there are people that have received legacy letters that maybe the person, what they want for, for that person isn't necessarily what the person wants. And, ah. you know, that can be, I think there's a little bit of responsibility in writing a legacy letter because you only want the person to feel good about receiving it. Um, so I, I do believe that there is a little bit of intention that, that will only make the legacy letter that much more well-received. Mm. Okay, that's an interesting point. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Do you have some other tips on maybe what to include or not include or think about when you're deciding what to include or how you approach it even? I mean, I think a lot of people would sit down with a blank piece of paper and a pen and say, I really want to do this, but how do I do this? Yeah, so the first thing you do is you really think about, you know, what do I want to say to that person? And I think it depends on the, the person that you're writing, the age of the person, um, you know, what you want to say. And, and people who are listening, you might sit down and think, okay, after listening to this podcast, I want to go ahead and write a legacy letter. And then five years from now, you might say, hey, you know what? I, I want to revisit that legacy letter because the people that I wrote that letter to are older. They're in a different space. I'm in a different space and that's perfectly okay. But you know, some of the, in my book, I have so many different journal prompts to start writing the legacy letter, but mm -hmm. you know, some of them can be, here's what I want you to know, or what I learned from my life or the top 10 reasons I'm proud of you or what I hope for you. Just, you know, things like that. And then you can kind of break it down. But I definitely believe that anything written from your heart is always going to be well received. Anything written from your heart to the people that you love, um, you know, how can that not be anything but beneficial to the recipient? And, yeah. you know, sometimes people say, well, my handwriting's not that great or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And here's what I'll say. I'll say one, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you know, again, you're writing something to the people that you love. So again, we're not trying to be perfect. We're trying to be real and, and have it be heartfelt too. If you're someone that says, I just can't write with a pen or pencil. I, I really want to do this from the computer. Then go for it. Do it from the computer. I will say print it out though and put it in an envelope because I remember my mom, I had received a letter from her that she had written when she was really, when she was starting to decline, my family took a trip to uh, Alaska. And after that trip, she wrote a letter to my husband and I and emailed it. And unfortunately we didn't print it out. And, uh -huh. you know, we don't have that computer anymore. We don't, that's long gone. And so uh -huh. for me personally, like it's easier to, take a letter and put it in an envelope and put it in a safe place. And I have all of my really meaningful letters now in a bag or tied with a ribbon um, in a special place. But mm. I, I think a lot of times we send texts or emails, but they don't get printed out. They don't get saved. And so mm. you just want them to be saved. Mm. Well, and I, I suppose too, that if the person doesn't want to handwrite the whole letter, but they, they print it, like you suggested, then they can always write, you know, something short on the bottom or even just sign off love yeah. mom or whatever. And you got a little bit of handwriting there. Yes. I love that. I think that's a great idea because you know, gosh, there's something, there's something about seeing my mom's handwriting. She had such a distinct handwriting as we all do. And you know, there's something just really nice about seeing that handwriting. I have a lot of letters from both my grandmothers as well, who lived into their eighties. And so after my mom passed away, they're, importance in my life was just that much more felt and each of their handwritings is so distinct I can look at an envelope and know immediately who wrote me that letter and mm -hmm. it's just really comforting to me to see the handwriting of the the, the people that I've loved and lost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah are you saying that I can 
I can remember, I can recognize my grandmother's handwriting versus my mom's handwriting versus my dad's handwriting. I'm not so sure my kids appreciate my handwriting all that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I mean, we, I also remind myself of this, like my kids now are 18 and 21, but you know, the older my kids get, the more they will appreciate all of the letters that I've sent to them. And even now my daughter's a junior in college. I have, since she started going to school, I have made it, it's been very important to me to write her a letter almost every week and send her that letter. And that's just a just because letter. There's no reason I'm just thinking about you. But I always tend to try to give her a little bit of, you know, mom advice that I feel like she's definitely going to get because she's going to read the letter, right? Like I know she's going to read the letter. Yeah. Um, and then I, this is with a, like a stamp in the mailbox, right? Yeah. Stamp in the mailbox. And we okay. text all day long. I mean, she texts me, we FaceTime, but at the end of the day, like I know she loves getting these letters because, um, you know, she's told me over and over again, that she keeps them in a special place in, at school and that it means a lot to her to have them. And so what I was going to say is the older our kids get, the more valuable letters from their parents become. And so mm. I think that never feel like your kid isn't going to appreciate having this letter one day, because I definitely feel like they will, mm. even if, even if they don't show it now. Or, or you don't think they will today. Right. Okay, so this is great. I think we're shifting into the part of the conversation about maybe regular letters, for lack of a better word. And so I think, but backing up before we get to that, because I think on this legacy letter topic, I'm thinking of my listeners and I'm thinking there might almost be two um, purposes, isn't the word I'm looking for. But like, if most of my listeners are widowed parents. So they might be thinking, you know, themselves now of writing some kind of legacy letters to their kids. Um, some of my listeners, increasingly so actually, are not widowed parents yet, but they have spouses who are terminally ill or seriously ill. And so they might be thinking of helping or arranging yes. for their spouse to write something for, yes. you know, presumably more imminent loss. Um, but but for listeners who are already widowed, um, like presumably I'm not going to die anytime soon, I hope, right? But um, I wonder if you have any suggestions about like, is there a, like, should I just sit down and write a legacy letter today? Should I, if I'm going in for a surgery, should I write a letter? Like, what do you think about some of that kind of stuff? I think it's incredibly important for anyone who has kids to really think about writing a legacy letter. And especially if your kids have one parent who is alive, I think that sitting down and writing that letter to your kids is even that much more important and meaningful. And also kind of letting them know sort of, you know, what you hope for them, or, you know, you know that maybe it's going to be hard for them. And you know that they're strong enough to handle whatever life tosses their way. And I'll, I'll let you know a little, I'll, I'll share this with you. Uh, this isn't in my book, but um, when my grandmother passed away and we were going through the safety deposit box, you know, my dad had, was going through all that. There was a letter that my grandfather had written to my dad and to my uncle when and, and they were initially from Germany. So they came to this country from Germany and they settled into a small town in Virginia. And they, my grandfather wrote a letter to his two young boys. And the letter was to be read upon the death of the second parent. And so my grandmother lived into her 80s. So we're reading this letter, but basically the letter was a legacy letter. And it was, you know, boys, if something, if you're reading this letter, it's because something's happened to your, your, your mom and I, and here's what we want for you. And here's what we hope for you. And we know that you're, you're going to be okay. And, you know, just all the things, mm -hmm. but it was really, it was really interesting to see that because it, it was such a generous gift that my grandfather that he sat down and took the time to write that letter to them mm. um, because 
God forbid if something had happened to both of them when my dad and my uncle were young, this letter really would have been incredibly meaningful to them. And so I think for all your listeners, definitely I encourage you to take the time to really think about what you want to say to your kids and just and say it, put it mm -hmm. on paper. Um, again, I have a lot of things that can help you through that, but don't wait. Don't wait until, um, you know, hopefully we're all going to be here for a really long time. But um, I think you'll feel better. Your listeners will feel better having done this as well. There's mm -hmm. something, there's something sort of, it invokes peace, if you will, that God forbid, if something were to happen, I put this out there to my kids. Yeah. And, and, and for your question about anyone who has a spouse who's sick and, you know, whether or not you should encourage them to write something, I, I, I'm going to go with yes, because again, I feel like anything written from your heart to the people that you love and care about is very generous and meaningful. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I just was thinking of something and I've promptly forgotten it. But the <laughs> second thing I was thinking of that I was going to mention was, and I, I think I mentioned that my friend had encouraged me to get my husband to write cards and I did. And he wrote only one to each okay. kid. And it was, and I wrote about this in my book actually that just came out. It was, for me, it was terrible because he, he had brain cancer and he was, cognitively confused and he never remembered that he was dying so I'm like okay maybe writing them letters is a good idea but how am I going to go in and say hey, by the way you're dying you should write these cards like yeah so. <laughs> you know I mean here's the thing there's nothing easy at all about watching someone you love get to go, go get to the end of their life and go through a lot of the things that a lot of us have seen the people that we love go through. There's nothing easy about it. It's hard and it sucks. And it forces us to have conversations that we don't want to be having that are mm -hmm. hard and that, yeah. um, you know, leave us feeling devastated and crying and, you know, all the things. But I've come to realize that just because something's hard doesn't necessarily mean that it's not worth it. And, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've had a lot of hard conversations in my life and at the end of the day, I don't regret having them. Maybe at the time they were really difficult, but I feel like sometimes my relationships have even gotten stronger or I feel closer to that person for having gone through some of those hard conversations, Yeah. but none, but none of it's easy. Right. I remembered the other thing I was thinking of, and I'm going to say this as much for myself as for my listeners, because I think I need to remind myself of this, that um, so many of us who, you know, our spouse has died. So the kid's other parent has died. Those kids know all too well that sometimes bad things can happen. And yeah. oftentimes those kids or teenagers are their anxiety around the surviving parent dying is like sky high. Absolutely. And, yeah. And I'm just thinking, so I'm reminding myself now, writing a letter like this would, I think, be um, yeah. important, right? Because at least I can know that if, if something happens to me, which knock on wood, presumably it's not, but you know, it might, we know that it might, right? I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. So Wait. writing yeah. those letters and having those for my kids would give me some measure and hopefully my listeners, you know, that I've done what I can to prepare them for a future. I do think that you're right. I think it would bring you a lot of peace. I think it would bring your listeners a lot of peace. Um, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, my kids were 11 and 14. And because my kids had seen how devastated my mom's death, how, how much that impacted me, they were devastated that something was going to happen to me mm. and that they were going to go through that. And, and so just even that experience, the, the kids, they understand that life is so fragile and that anything can happen to anyone at any time. And that is incredibly anxiety provoking for kids. Yeah. And look, it's anxiety provoking for adults. And so, um, you know, I think, Anything that maybe we can do to help lessen that burden a little bit for our kids is a gift. Yeah. 
Yeah, good. Okay. Let's shift back to where we were starting to go, which is the quote-unquote regular letters. I don't know if you have a name for them, but the, the letters that you write in everyday life, you talked about how... Just because. Just, just because, because letters. letters. Yeah. Okay, yes, that's much better than regular letters. That, does, that sounds boring. <laughs> um, because I think this, you know, as, as widowed parents, we are now, you know, we are parents still, and you know, now we're only parents, but... Um, you know, we may be looking for some new ideas or ways to change things up a little bit or ways to connect better with our kids or maybe some new practice we could introduce that might be somehow helpful. So can you tell us about, you know, what you've done and your suggestions around that? Absolutely. So um, I have two suggestions. The first one is the mother daughter journal that I used with my kids when they were young. Um, hmm. So let me tell you a little bit about how this would work and why I think it would be really good for your listeners. So um, when my kids were little, I went to TJ Maxx. I got two $3 journals. Um, you know, on one of them, I wrote Zoe's mommy daughter journal. On the other one, I wrote Avi's mommy da daughter journal. I Wait, wrote. Let me inter yeah. ask. You said they were young. Like, how old are we talking about? They were young. Um, in they were in middle school. And okay. uh, my, my, my oldest was in middle school. I think she was in fifth grade. My other one was younger. But okay. here's the thing. So I would write to them and put it on their pillow and they would write back to me and put it on my pillow. There were no rules at all. It was just a way for us to communicate and for me to share things, for me to boost their self-esteem and try to help them with whatever was going on. And so during the pandemic, I actually made two free templates for people. One is um, a mommy child journal for younger kids, but the other one is a sharing journal for people who have older kids, maybe teenagers or even college students. And they're just, they can download them, they're free. They're, they're, they're journals to be used, or you don't even have to use these, just get a plain notebook, but there are ways for you to connect and boost the self-esteem and have some maybe conversations that maybe you're not comfortable having face-to-face, -face. but I, definitely feel like this would be a great tool for people who maybe their child isn't talking right now. And maybe they see that their child is carrying a lot of um, sadness or anxiety. And they want to maybe say, you know, hey, I just want you to know I'm here for you. I, I'm not going to judge you. I'm always I'm so proud of you, you know, all the things. Mm. And I think it'd be a really beautiful thing. I can't tell you how happy even now and I have an 18 year old daughter who's a senior in high school. Sometimes, you know, I'll write to her and I'll put it on her pillow and I'm not expecting anything back. If she writes back to me and puts it on mine, great. But you know what? If not, I still know that she probably most definitely read what I was going to say to her. And that's different than sometimes me saying things and me feeling like it's going in one ear and out the other. Mm, yeah, I, I know she's it's being received. Um, that's and so, such a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I encourage anyone who wants to connect with their child, no matter the age, to consider, you know, doing some form of a sharing journal. You can even do it via email and the templates that we have that you can download, they can be used via email as well. Um, the Just Because letter, we'll write Just Because letters even now. You know, I'll write a Just Because letter and put it on my daughter's mirror in the morning and, or she'll write me a little letter and put it on my, right by my sink when I'm washing my face at night. So the people don't have to necessarily not be living in your house. You can just mm. write a little letter that says a little note. Hey, just want you to know, I'm so proud of you for whatever happened today. You're rocking or whatever. Love, you know, mom, love dad, and just stick it on there by their sink or on their pillow. Or, you know, it's just, it's really love letters from your heart to the people mm -hmm. that you love. And it yeah. means so much. I love that. Uh, so just a practical question. Uh, let's say I went out and bought a journal and go to, you know, to the whatever Michaels or something and picked up a journal. Like how often are you right? Did you, how often did you write back and forth? And are these like a sentence or 10 pages or like what? And I suppose the answer might be, it depends, but can you give oh, us some guidelines yeah. or tips? So here's the answer. There are no rules. Uh -huh. Because we don't want any rules because rules tend to feel burdens, you know, tend to feel heavy and oh God, yet here's another thing on my to-do list. No rules. If you feel like writing a letter, grab a journal, write whatever you feel like saying, put it on the pillow. If a month goes by, then a month goes by, you know, like 
for me, I feel like when I'm forced to do something, that's when resistance tends to want to show up. And so, you know, when my kids were little and we started this, we, we started it by saying, there are no rules. If you want to write back and put it on my pillow, great. And if you want to wait, you know, two to three months and then, or because life is busy, then that's okay. And Mm. I think it'll just happen authentically if there aren't any parameters, because really Mm. what happens is you're, it's fun to walk into your room and see a journal sitting on your pillow. Yeah. It's a surprise. Yeah. And especially right now during the pandemic, like every little nugget of a surprise or goodness just goes that much further. But um, you've got to, you've got to write the journal to get the journal back. And so, you know, I think they're going to, I think they're going to like it. That was going to be my next question. Did you ever like write something, put it on the pillow, not get it back and then like go and retrieve it from the pillow and write a second message without one coming back to you. Yeah, no, I never did that. Um, But I mean, I guess maybe I would say like if a few months went by, like to when my kid, you know, I sure loved getting to write little, a little message to you in your journal. I hope you liked it when I put it on your pillow and, you know, maybe they would say, Oh yeah, I'm going to get that back to you. You know, that kind Uh, of thing. Yeah. So without nagging no nagging sure right you don't want to become another <laughs> homework chore another yeah. like mom wants me no. to do this right exactly it's supposed to be a positive thing it, it, it's only you only want it to be a positive thing yeah yeah i love that i'm gonna think about this and come up with some ways to implement this i think around here i i encourage you to do it i don't think you'll be disappointed Mm, mm. And I think your kids will really, even if they pretend like they're too cool and that they don't really like it, I promise you they're going to like it. Yeah. Well, and that's the interesting part about the teenager aspect of this, right? Because, because like you mentioned, sometimes, you know, the verbal discussion with the teenager might feel like it's going out when, in one ear and out the other, or it might be met with like, oh, mom, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, plus they could like reread it multiple times if it's right there. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So what I know is that, you know, that saying, like, if you want to, if you want to have good friends, you have to be a good friend. If you want to receive letters, you have to write letters, you know, um, right. the fact that my daughter writes me letters and puts them on my, by my sink and on my mirror and on my pillow tells me that she likes it when I give them to her. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, that teaches me that, that she sees the value. Right. Terrific. I love it. Oh, this is great. Okay. What have we not talked about yet? What have I missed? What else do my listeners know about? Um, what else? Should, well, you know, traditions, I think family traditions are really important. And what I realized when I was going through that bag of letters is that, you know, I am in the present moment today, a link between the past my mom and my grandmothers and the future, my daughters. And so I feel, I feel like it is a responsibility to figure out ways to carry the past into the present so that it will be remembered in the future. And so um, I think it's really important to figure out, you know, what traditions look like for you and your family. And even, you know, after we lose someone, sometimes we have to be flexible and recognize that things change and that some of our traditions might change a little bit. And so But just to be a little bit intentional, I think um, favorite recipes and and food is always a beautiful way to remember someone. Um, I really struggled with how to let my daughters know about my mom. I really wanted them to just not just look at a picture, but to know her. And my mom loved eating ice cream sundaes. And so every year on the anniversary of her death and on her birthday, we always had ice cream sundaes. And so, you know, that was a way for us to positively bring my mom into our lives. And so Mm -hmm. I encourage all your listeners to find your ice cream sundae, figure out what the person that you loved and lost really enjoyed doing, whether or not that's planting a tree, gardening, going on a long hike, poetry, whatever it is, and find a way to insert that into your life, because Mm -hmm. that helps you move forward while taking the person with you. And Mm. it helps our kids. It helps our kids get to connect more with that person. And it helps them feel like 
they can talk about that person and um, that it's okay to move forward because they're taking that person with them. Mm. Yeah. And that point at the end there about no- letting them know it's okay to talk about the person. I think that's a huge point, a huge you know part of this, because a lot of times kids are afraid of upsetting their surviving parent. If yeah. they mention, if they bring up dad, they bring up mom, whatever. Right. And that's, um, yeah the kid then almost is like feeling like they have to take care of the surviving parent because they don't want them to be sad. So if the, I think the parents sometimes have to be deliberate about like, even if it's not a big thing, even if it's just like, Oh, dad loved this or mom loved that. It kind of lets them know that you can talk about them. And it's part of normal conversation. I totally agree with you. I think the word there that you used deliberate is really important because our kids are watching everything that we do. And if we're deliberate about talking about our loved one, then they will see that it's okay for us to talk about it. And it's almost like you're giving them permission without, without having that conversation, without sitting down and saying, Hey, you know, I think we really need to be talking about mom or dad because I'm feeling like we're not, instead of having that conversation, you're just showing them. Mm. that it's okay to talk about their loved one and, and that's giving them permission. And the last thing that we want our kids to feel is guilt. There's already so many emotions that they're feeling and we don't want to add guilt to the, to the list. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Good. I love it. Gosh, I think we keep talking about letters all day and I could keep hearing about letters all day because I definitely need some kind of poking to get myself, you know, on the ball with this. Cause it feels like one of those things, you know, it is technically not urgent. I don't have to do it today, but today becomes tomorrow and tomorrow becomes the next day. And pretty soon 10 years have gone by and I haven't written a letter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? You're right. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's what a lot of us who have loved and lost understand is that time is precious and there is an uncertainty about life. And so, you know, I know for myself, I feel better after I sort of have my ducks in a row, if you will. It just feels, it feels like I'm controlling something that I can't really control. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense. All right, well, let's just let's just wrap up here with one final question. Um, and maybe you partially just answered this, but if you could say one thing to listeners who are thinking like, well, maybe I should write a letter, but I'm just not sure. Maybe I have this blocker or this objection or not objection, but, you know, resistance or something. What would you say to them? I would say 100% don't find an excuse, find a way. You know, mm-hmm. don't... Don't delay if it's if you feel called or you like this idea or you think that it's something that you would want to do, just write the letter and it doesn't have to be perfect. And like we said, you can revisit it two years from now, three years, five years, 10 years as you change, as your kids change. But, you know, I think you'll feel really good when you sit down and write the letter because it actually feels good to write a letter and think about the person that you are writing the letter to. And, you know, what I found is that everyone wins. I enjoy writing the letter. The recipient enjoys reading the letter. It's just, it's good all around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Um, So my guest today is Dara Kurtz, the author of I Am My Mother's Daughter, Wisdom on Life, Loss and Love and the creator of the Crazy Perfect Life blog. So Dara, where can listeners find you and find your book and your blog if they'd like to learn more? So they can visit my blog at crazyperfectlife.com. There's links to get the book, get, there's five free gifts they can download, the journals, as I mentioned, all the things. So they can, they can find about, out about everything. They can also, of course, get it on Amazon. And then I'm on Facebook at Crazy Perfect Life and on Instagram at Crazy Perf Life. Okay, terrific. Well, I'll put all those links in the show notes so people can find those. And uh, Dara, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Oh, thank you. It was such a joy to spend time with you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dara Kurtz as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 97. And a shout out today to all my listeners in North Carolina in honor of today's guest. And if you are listening and you happen to be in the Chapel Hill, North Carolina area, 
Be sure you check out the groups that they have at UNC Chapel Hill for both widowed dads originally, and they've added now groups for widowed moms as well. Uh, you can hear all about it in episode 9 with Justin Yap, and he is located there and started the group for dads a number of years ago along with his colleague. And they wrote a terrific book. It's called The Group, Seven Widowed Fathers Reimagine Life. So I always recommend that for sure for all widowed dads who reach out to me. Um, definitely. And then also, it's actually interesting and relevant for people who are widowed moms as well. Um, so it's really for everybody, but if you're a widowed dad, it's a, it's a must read. Um, so anyway, North Carolina people, check out the programs there. And if you're not in North Carolina... Um, pick up the book, and also look at the resources they have on their website, which is widowedparent.org. Speaking of resources, a few resources for you this week. I wanted to make sure you guys know about the Speaking Grief documentary, which is from the public television station WPSU. It's available at speakinggrief.org. You can watch it for free there. Terrific documentary. Um, It actually came out last summer, and I mentioned it then, but I wanted to mention it again in case you missed it or it's still in your queue to uh, to watch, I think that is, is worth watching. And like I said, it's available to watch for free at speakinggrief.org. And uh, another resource, the Dougie Center has a new searchable directory for finding grief programs in every community. Um, You can put in your zip code if you're in the U.S. or you can put in your city, your location. Uh, You can also put in cities and and countries um, outside the U.S. So it is a worldwide searchable directory put together by the Dougie Center. Excuse me, the Dougie Center. Um, They have trained quite a few of the programs in the directory um, and there are other ones listed as well. So do check that out for um, kids and family grief programs near you. And one more research this week. This actually looks like a really cool thing. The New York Times is having their eighth annual student editorial contest. And it's for middle schoolers and high schoolers. And I think the deadline is in April sometime. And basically, the um, students can submit an essay. I think it's 450 words max. Um, on some topic that they're passionate about. And the New York Times wants to hear from from kids and uh, wants them to be passionate and persuasive in their written pieces. So do check that out if you have a kid who either likes to write or is passionate about some topics. And apparently it can be any topic. It can be, um, you know, political, not political, um, any topic that they are passionate about. So um, check that out. I will put all the links to all three of those resources in this week's email that's going out and in this week's blog post. So if you're not getting my emails, be sure to get on the list at jennylisk.com and you can find the blog post there as well. Okay, once again, please remember to rate and review the show and Apple Podcasts so that more widowed parents can find it. Thank you for listening, and until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.